Hello, Foot Clan. It is I, Mike, the Fantasy Hitman, right? My face will be revealed on today's show. What happened? You'll have to stay tuned to find out. Hey, Foot Clan, want to invite you over to jointhefoot.com, our fantasy football community. We're always making it better, stronger, better, better, better. That's the theme song for it. Thanks, Kanye. You can go to join the foot. You can support the podcast. We're fully independent. You get uh, you get a bonus podcast. You get bonus. an extra episode. We're even recording that one today. You unlock premium resources. You get access to Foot Clan leagues in the off season. You get access to the forums. The Megalobowl. The Megalobowl. Game day alerts. We're going to be adding a Discord server. Yeah, that's right. Oh, my. A Discord server announced right here, right now. And a whole lot more. You can head over to jointhefoot.com and learn how to support. And Foot Clan want to remind everybody about Pristine Auction. Pristine Auction is the most amazing website out there. If you're looking for any kind of special gifts, things to make your office awesome, Pristine Auction has signed memorabilia from all sorts of sports stars. They're always authenticated. And because it's an auction, you bid on whatever you want at whatever price you want. And you don't pay anything unless you just steal it away at a price you love. So check it out. Hundreds of daily auctions. PristineAuction.com. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Coming to you from PristineAuction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh my goodness! Hey, welcome into the podcast, the fantasy footballers back. Andy, Mike, Jason, tons of storylines in the world of fantasy football. None bigger, no, none bigger than <laughs> what's taking place across the table from me today. We have a new member <laughs> of the Fantasy Footballers. Oh. I have never seen this man before. No, me neither. I still have the same terrible voice, though. Now, I believe you it call... sounds like you. you. You know his name. It doesn't and look And it's called... Like you. He's Cool Andy. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we were joking. Now he looks... So uh, oh if, my if, you if you're not watching on YouTube, you first no of all... You have no idea what's happening. Fix oh. your life. Watch on YouTube.com slash the Fantasy Footballers. At least subscribe. Sure. <laughs> um, Pad the numbers. Yeah. But the thing is, is Mike usually has this large beard. Yep. Mm -hmm. And now he doesn't. Yeah. That's, that's true. Yesterday. No fanfare. This just happened. I have the largest beard here You do. Now. Congratulations. Oh, stealing your brand, bro. But yeah, I mean, the, the decision yesterday, well, I mean, I thought about it on and off, but I was like, I'm doing it. So I cut the beard off. It is very, it's very Flush to the face. My chin looks different than I remember. <laughs> it's my, been a little while. My face is a little rounder than I remember. And the, the <laughs> so this was a complete surprise to my uh, entire family. Oh, my when, gosh. When I got home, they were all at the, the kids had tumbling. So I, I gave it the old snippety snip. Came, wow. came down the stairs. The wife didn't know. No, she had no idea. Oh, my gosh. And the the youngest of my family immediately burst into tears <laughs> <laughs> and like a legit real like real real sad crying he's never seen me without a giant beard in, in his entire life and he said to my wife he said it's like daddy died and now i have to live with a new dad oh my <laughs> and, goodness and he oh. proceeded proceeded to weep for about 15 to 20 minutes because he was so terrified daddy wow. died and now i have to live with a new dad <laughs> So wow! It went, it went really well. Wow! Is he is he making progress this morning yes. with it? Yeah, we we worked. I mean, it's it not out. like you're clean shaven. That would have just been. We worked it. Oh goodness! That yeah, would have been, been out of the house. Yes, I did the clean shaven one time, and I got the same reaction from the kids. It was unacceptable. There was tears. People have begged me holding on to my you know shirt. Do not do that again. Yeah, yes. last Halloween when I went as Jeff Fisher and had to shave down to a mustache and then proceeded to shave that. My wife said I look like a human thumb <laughs> and that I am no longer allowed to ever shave my face again. A human 
A human thumb. Yeah, like, like if, a you walking, drew a, if you yeah. drew eyes and a yeah. nose and a mouth on the front of your thumb, then you look at and it. When your wife says I have it, no chin. When your wife says it, you know it's true. Right. That, that you look like a thumb. Yes, because she hates me. <laughs> you have the biggest beard in the studio. Well, it's it's a whole new mic. He's wearing a leather jacket. He's clearly the cool version of me. This <laughs> <laughs> is the middle of my life. I'm freaking uh, out, man. Yeah, man. My, wife, my wife's first reaction was, is he going through a midlife crisis? <laughs> my wife asked did you, me that. Did you actually. or did you not buy a Mazda Miata last night? <sighs> Already had one, bro. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, welcome in. Uh, we've got a Wednesday a, segment a for you. Miata? A Mazda Miata. Mazda <laughs> Miata. Buy or sell. Presented by Pristine Auction. Oh, it's a whole new day here in the office. Yes. All right. Buy or sell presented by Pristine Auction. Week five, we've got an NFC East edition of Buy or Sell. Let's start with this one. Making his debut on the 2019 season, Golden Tate. Buy or sell. 50 receiving yards against Minnesota. I'm going to sell because I think he's going to operate close to the line of scrimmage and be worked in and this is a bad matchup, this is a really good line, right? Because you expect him to get enough work. But I, th I think that the targets he's gonna, going to receive are going to be very uh, low-value targets. So I'm going to say I'm going to take the under. It's going to be very interesting because Sterling Shepard has been playing very well for this team, but he's been playing very well uh, getting yards out of the slot, and that's where Golden Tate really thrives. So like, are we going to see a situation where there's <laughs> – they're just arguing on the field. Like, hey, hey, Sterling, that's where I'm supposed to be. And they just keep swapping places. Like, game is of uh, musical chairs. I'll buy it. And I'll buy it on the fact that Golden Tate was signed this past offseason to a four-year, $37 million deal for a reason. He gets to make his debut. You want to protect Daniel Jones. You don't have Saquon Barkley. I think, I think we'll see more than 50 yards from Golden Tate. 50 is so. not a huge number. No. I, but I'm, man. You're a sell? I just don't know who's going where. Okay. Well, I, so I, I will sell Golden. for that. All right. Chris Thompson, 50 yards receiving against New England. 50? 50 yards. What kind of a line is this? I'm buying. Thompson. Yeah, I'm buying that as well. He's He has failed to hit 50 receiving yards once this season, and that's because it was 48. <laughs> like, I, I am going to sell. Ooh. Oh. And the reason I'm going to sell is because it is the New England Patriots. I think that they're going to keep things in front of them, and so you'll get some dump-offs from Chris Thompson. But the difference is they're not going to be playing some crazy prevent where he runs for 20 or 30 yards like he did in several of these games where you know it, he got over the 50-yard mark. It's, it's a good line. Obviously, he's done it three out of four times. He's certainly capable, and it's just a matter of what New England decides to take away. But I think that they don't want Chris Thompson to – uh, run wild in the open, and they'll be prepared. Brooks, because we're competitive here and because I need to know, you you should give us standings on this week to week. I'd like to know how our buyer sells went from the week preceding and who, yes. who was right, who was wrong. That's a great idea. So now you have more job responsibilities. You will not be paid more. You'll be paid the same. Sounds great. <laughs> All right, Amari That's Cooper. That's a pretty good deal. <laughs> <laughs> Amari Cooper, uh, does he have a top 10 wide receiver finish Ooh. in him against Green Bay this week? Amari Cooper, a top 10 finish against Green Bay. It was a disappointing yet still better than Juju Smith-Schuster week for Amari Cooper last week. Fair. And Green Bay's, they, they gave up a, a significant amount of points against Philadelphia, but not a lot of yardage through the air for Carson Wentz. I... A top 10 finish. Wow. I'm definitely going to sell. Tyron definitely. Smith, definitely. Tyron Smith, left tackle, sure. is out of the game. The few games we've seen without him, Dak Prescott is not the same when he does not have that protection. The Green Bay Packers defense has been great. Amari Cooper had a very good week one and was 14th, not top 10. So I'm going to say he doesn't hit top 10. I think this line is just a little too high for me to be confident. Yeah, top 10 is... It's a tough place to get in there, and like you were saying, Jay, that he had over 100 yards and a touchdown, and if he wasn't top 10 with that line, it's it can be pretty tough to get in there. He is at home, which really helps. So Amari Cooper, both home games have been 
very good. The road games he has failed to surpass 50 receiving yards. The the injury to Smith, though, is a, a massive concern, so I will sell a top 10. I think I'll join you guys. If if 19.6 fantasy points in week one wasn't good enough for top 10, that's a you know, he's the, he's a wide receiver seven on the year, but that doesn't mean he gives you a top ten performance every week. So I'll it's, take a better game. You than also last don't week. have you know you don't have help. If I'm the Green Bay secondary, their defense, I'm focusing on Amari Cooper and letting the Randall Cobb, Devin Smith of the world attempt, and you know Jason Witten, who led the team in receiving last week, beat you. Not Amari Cooper. Yeah, so this, I'll, I'll sell it as a this, top ten finish. This is one of those like you're, you're taking the field. Like right now, Amari Cooper right. is my number seven ranked wide receiver on the week. And you go well. You're saying he's top 10, but in reality, there's a bunch of people that you'll never guess that have big blow-up games every single week, hop into that top 10. So I'm taking the field here to say he has an okay to good game, but there's too many people. All right, Zach Ertz, does he get his first touchdown of the year against Ooh. the New York Jets this week? Zach Ertz, buy or sell, first touchdown of the season. I'll go first again. I'm going to buy for the first time today. Zach Ertz has had eight touchdowns the last two seasons. That includes two seasons ago when he was only on the, I think he was around 110 targets two seasons ago. He's a guy that, you know, he's about an eight touchdown a year type of player. And we're going into week five. He doesn't have his first touchdown. Dallas Goddard caught one. He's he's a great weapon near the goal line, and I, I think he comes out on top. It seems oh. like Deshaun Jackson is not going to play. Have it you does. guys read no, anything? Not been positive. No, okay. there's not really a lot known about how he's progressing or how long it's going to be, but it's definitely trending in the wrong direction. So, <clears throat> probability wise, he's he's still got it's it's a much better chance with DJX off the field. But I'm gonna I'm gonna sell. Well, eight I mean, this is yeah. just this is just kind of fluky stuff. Betting it on is. Touchdowns, well, even so. even even bringing up the eight touchdown line. That would be a touchdown every other game. That'd be a 50-50. And so you flip a coin here. I'm going to I'm gonna sell it. I think he'll keep his goosing trend going. Dak Prescott, a top 10 quarterback against Green Bay. So this is the other side of the Amari question. Only it, we, skipped, we skipped one number to talk about Zach Ertz for a second. Zach, uh, Dak Prescott, top 10, Green Bay, buy or sell? You know, ironically, three out of the four weeks he has been top 10, even though Amari Cooper – Three out of the four weeks has not been top ten. I think it's a little bit easier for him. He's got the rushing baseline. That being said, I believe Green Bay is a good defense. Tyron Smith not being there at left tackle is going to hurt. Michael Gallup trending towards not playing still. So I'm going to sell. Yeah, I have him ranked currently right on that fringe where it would be easy for him to get knocked out by the outliers. So I'm going to sell as well. Last week, Carson Wentz in Green Bay finished at 10 on the dot. And he was gifted a lot of things to yeah. finish at number 10. Carson Wentz has not finished outside the top 10 a single week so far this year. I'm going to buy Dak at the back end of the top 10. So That was Buy Yourself from Pristine Auction. You heard it at the top. Check them out for autographed sports memorabilia, your favorite player, your favorite team, all sorts of stuff. Great for gifts, great surprise gifts, autographed, authentic memorabilia. Use the registration code BALLERS. A uh, couple reminders for you. Head to the website, thefantasyfootballers.com, for weekly in-season articles. We have a, a number of new articles up there, a Target Report article, a Dynasty Report article. So definitely check that out. And then go to footclangiveaway.com if you want to enter to win a signed Saquon Barkley jersey that we're giving away. I believe the deadline's going to be the end of October. So you have some time to enter at footclangiveaway.com. Let's go ahead and get into the news. News and notes from around the league presented by Sleeper. All right. As expected, John Ross, the shoulder injury, he is going to miss multiple games. Expected. He's expected to the, miss multiple games. The verbiage has still been expected. I have not seen it upgraded to a confirmed he's missing multiple games. My understanding of the shoulder injury is that he broke the glass that is oh, oh, his body. Boo! Boo! Just, just a pretty quick turn for a man who traded Mark Andrews for him in a dynasty league. Well, look. Well, it's a <laughs> dynasty league. He's got a long future. He'll play half of his games going forward. So you'd buy a glass, a glass player. He's a glass in a dynasty. Full. So like in a long term situation. In fairness, in fairness, when we made that trade, that was not 
this season while either one of these guys broke out. That was last year when they were both hopeful <laughs> players. <laughs> sure, sure. Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin says James Conner is still being evaluated. He'll be limited this week. That will dictate his availability against the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, ho hopefully, and I, I guess I saw a lot of people on Twitter already do this. I think it was helpful yesterday to give people the target of on Johnson in the bye week for tra as a trade target for sell high type of players. I saw a lot of people take advantage of that. Connor could be limited in the game if he plays. He could also miss the game, and that would turn Jalen Samuels into an absolute must, must star. Yeah. And so we will let you know what's going on with Connor. I think this is the second time this season that we've dealt with kind of him yes. being banged up. Yeah, it was his knee, I believe, the first time. There's a lot, a lot of issues there, and coming off of the nice game, if I could unload that big name, I would. Eagles wide receiver Deshaun Jackson, as we said, remains sidelined. We'll keep you up to date over the course of the week. It's not been suggested that he's playing this week. Sam Darnold will practice today. That's good. That's good news. Uh, it, it still does not mean he's going to play this week. They can practice with him and not hit him. It's a matter of the spleen. It always <laughs> is. It always <laughs> is. Tyrell Williams did not uh, practice today. Monitor that. Williams has been actually one of the more interesting, consistent performers at the wide receiver position. He's catching touchdowns. Yeah, but it's happening uh, with – you know, often. So we'll see what happens. He's the wide receiver 14 on the year right now, but we'll keep you up to date with that. Gardner Minshew has emerged on the injury report Ooh. with a knee problem. Mm. We'll see if he's limited. And then Vernon Davis was placed in the concussion protocol and is probably highly irrelevant for your fantasy team this week against New England with possibly Dwayne Haskins, oh, goodness. who may actually be the first player in NFL history to take the snap from a seated position on right. the ground. Or just one knee, like yeah. one knee on the ground, and yep. this is he's giving himself up right. immediately. Gruden. Gruden, look, man, we talked about this. <laughs> we know you're up against it. You can't do this to Dwayne. Don't play him. Also, can we it's go... It's not fair. Can we go back a few seconds to talk about the verbiage of Gardner Minshew emerging onto the depth chart? Like, <laughs> this is usually a really good... like. Gardner Minshew has emerged victory. Oh no, has emerged with a knee problem. Like I thought, the language was very suspect as well, Jason. Yeah, I didn't write it, but if I did, you're Ron Burgundy. <laughs> it, it's just very. Uh, it, it made me have a mental picture of him climbing kind of out of. I want to start doing this. The so I, want, I want to be much more positive. You know what I mean? We talk about like, oh no, this confusing this MRI is the came back positive. Right. Which means it's negative, but yes. like it sounds better. So I think what you meant is that you want to be way more confusing for people. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we'll see what happens with Minshew. Minshew's in the top five in completion percentage right now. Minshew's playing very well, and it, and for fantasy purposes, he's been very safe. All right, drop it like it's hot. Reminder. That's where you. That's normally where. Drop you, it like it's hot. See, if you're paying attention, you would have been there. Drop it like it's hot. What does that mean, Mike? That means you the waivers just ran, so you you run to your waiver wire and see if someone made a foolish mistake and dropped a player that they should not have. They usually do. They usually do. You are right. In our league, which the waivers just ran, Jared Goff hit the waiver wire. Yeah, it's fair. He's Ooh, his man in Seattle. Terrible. Josh Allen with the concussion in the bye week hit the waiver wire. I'm sure Mike doesn't want these things announced, but uh I in fact dropped Josh Allen. So I already knew that was going to happen. Yeah. Are you going to pick him up? <laughs> Drop it oh, like crap, it's hot. Somebody dropped Josh <laughs> Allen? <laughs> Drop it like it's hot worked. News and notes is always brought to you by the Sleeper app. Don't miss a single piece of impactful fantasy news throughout the season. Download the free app today. Why don't we thank today's sponsors for their unbridled support of this podcast we will do that hey foot clan are you an amazon prime member probably yes i am mm -hmm. did you know that you have thursday night football that's right thursday night football has returned to prime video for a third season the cool thing is you can catch all the action on your tv web mobile anywhere in the world and the experience is next level with prime videos x-ray feature you can access Next gen stats, play history, team information, and now it's available on iOS, Android, Fire tablets, and Fire TV. If you're ready to hear a new take on the game, 
You can switch over to Broadcast Legends, Hannah Storm, and Andrea Kramer for play-by-play. So if you don't have cable and you simply want to experience the future of football, tune in this Thursday. Coverage begins at 7 Eastern and kickoff is 8.20 Eastern. Also available on Fox and NFL Network, NFL Network simulcast. Subject to change, Thursday Night Football is presented by Bud Light Platinum. And Foot Clan, drum roll please, because we want to thank today's excellent sponsor, I am talking about none other than Postmates. If you've listened to the Spitballers podcast ever, you've heard me talk about Postmates, what a central piece of my life Postmates (laughs) is. Look, it's your personal food, grocery, whatever you can think of delivery service all year round, 24-7. No more trips to the store. No more having to say, oh, I'm hungry. We don't have anything to eat. Boom. I got something to eat at my door, delivered wherever I want. And look. They're like, they're the biggest on-demand network in the entire known universe. More than 25,000 partner merchants. And if we could be a partner merchant, if we had anything to, to deliver, yeah. I would sign up and make it 25000 one. But here's the coolest part. For a limited time, Postmates is giving our listeners $100 of free delivery credit for your first seven days. To start your free deliveries, download the app right now. And use the code FOOTBALLERS. That's code FOOTBALLERS for $100 of free delivery credit in your first seven days when you download the Postmates app. Get anything you need, anytime you need it. Download Postmates and save with code FOOTBALLERS. Here's a funny story about Amazon Prime that these guys like to troll me on. We don't live very far from one another. Well, not Amazon Prime, but Prime Prime Now. Now. Prime Now. We're all Prime members and have been for years. and. Uh, before I moved into this house, like Prime Now is also a regular part of my life, and our homes are very close, like like across the street. They are so close you could actually make it with a drone flight. Hang yes, on. yeah, I could, I, <laughs> you're exactly right, Jason. Thank you. That's 100 percent right. However, I'm in a different zip code, despite being directly across the street, and my zip code is basically the bottom of a massive stretch of land north, and so Prime Now doesn't come to me. Yeah, I think your zip so code includes a public, the Grand Canyon. Yeah. Yeah, so these guys have frequently had certain pizza shops and Prime Now all delivered to them. But they won't deliver across the street. And then I'm in the boonies across the street. That's right. So, All right, today we we have some snap count data we're going to look at. We've got some mailbag. We have a Thursday night preview. Let's kick it off. Make it snappy. All right, Snap Count Watch. It's, uh, there's an article on the website, Week 4 Snap Count Observations. You can read. You can check it out at thefantasyfootballers.com. Put that out every week. Yeah, but we, if you're four weeks in. This is a good time to take a little look-ski. Mm-hmm. Take a gander at some of the interesting situations uh, around the NFL and what's happening at important positions in terms of trends. At, you know, among, you know, in the NFL, there's very few players anymore that are the Ezekiel Elliott, right? You have a lot of situations where people are sharing time, committee backfields. What do you do with Ronald Jones and Peyton Barber? What do you do with, uh, you know, Matt Breida and Raheem Mostert? So let's look at the 49ers to start out with and how things have broken down because the 49ers, they're off, coming off the bye. They have Cleveland, the Rams, Washington coming up. They have the most fantasy points per game scored from the running back position. They've had the most opportunities per game at the running back position. Uh, the third most rushing yards. They're averaging 170 rushing yards per game. Now, now, real quick, the third most rushing yards, that's amazing. Keep in mind, they've only played three games. Everyone else has played four, and they're still the third most rushing yards. It's ridiculous. And this is Kyle Shanahan and what he's able to do. Now, you don't ideally want to talk about four different names when you're talking about a backfield. Sure, committee backs, yada, yada. You might share some time. Talking about Matt Breida, Raheem Moster, Jeff Wilson, and now Tevin Coleman potentially coming back, that is difficult. And so when you look at what's taken place so far, obviously Tevin Coleman, in week one, he was banged up. In week one, Matt Breida had 44% of the snaps, Moster had 29%, Coleman had 26%, but went out with an injury. So you look at the two weeks after, Breida was at 29%, whereas Moster was at 47% in week two. And then Breida was at 41% in week three against Pittsburgh. Mostert was at 30%. Now, Jeff Wilson oh, is, still, is Jeff. He's still tied for second in red zone rushing attempts, and he's only played in two of the four games. So we know there is 
Dude's got four rushing touchdowns. Yeah, there's a propensity <laughs> for Shanahan to go to the running back in the red zone. Now, we don't know if that's going to be Tevin Coleman when he comes back. I believe it will be. We don't know. You're 100% correct. Shanahan could do whatever. But I, my belief, based on what we've heard from trusted writers out of San Francisco, uh, what we've seen with Jeff Wilson, who was not even active on the roster prior to Tevin Coleman going down, I believe Tevin Coleman is going to be that goal line back, which the role, according to – my name is Jeff – seems – very valuable. I, I tried to make some trades for Tevin Coleman this week. Well, the Tevin Coleman play makes a lot of sense because even if he isn't handed that role or he splits that role, we know his involvement in the offense is going to be vastly different than that of Jeff Wilson Jr. It, for me, it's – I mean, it, you're you're delving into rational coaching once again, which is a very tumultuous place to be. But the fact that that role, the goal line role, was given to Jeff Wilson who – was not even active for the team week one. Like They said, okay, this is your job. Well, you have these two running backs who were already there in Burita and Mostert, and you chose not to give them that role. I mean, it, that to me speaks that Tevin Coleman would be the one to get it back unless they're, they, they go full wacky and play well, four running backs. Yeah, and, and if you want to look at it from a different perspective, I would only, I would simply say that you want to hand, you know, Matt Breed has had issues with injuries, and there's a certainly a certain amount of touches and workload they want to give him. Without Tevin Coleman, they knew that Breida, Mostert were going to carry the load. Breida mostly between the tackles. So there could be the narrative that, look, now you can spread it around, and we don't know for sure. But I, I like the bet on Tevin Coleman. The 49ers do run two running back sets 36% of the time. The league average is 9%. So they have a couple guys out there frequently. They give their running backs more touches than just about anybody in football. Now, as of right now, you who you, who do you have confidence starting this week? This week, I mean, Cleveland has been pretty good against the right. running back. They're ranked tenth in the league. I was looking at them when I was looking at some start of the week options at quarterback this week, saying, "Hey, what's going to happen in San Francisco?" But you're coming off the bye week, Jason. What were you going to say? This week, I think I am a hundred percent fine starting uh, Mostert and Brita. Those are the two that I'm. I'm assuming most that Coleman is. Is this a Coleman's so, inactive? I, I'm I I am saying I'm fine starting them either way because I truly believe that either way they will be involved. This I, it's rare to want to be okay with three backs on a team, and by rare I mean this is the only situation that exists like it. But if you over the last several weeks started any one of the three backs, including Jeff Wilson, you've been fine. Right. You've been really well. Kyle Shanahan's system it works for running backs. <laughs> You've been very well. You've been uh, very quite well. well. Quite well, indeed. So, and just a reminder, Tevin Coleman, he had that uh, the high ankle sprain, was given an evaluation of four to six weeks. So if he's back now, that's him doing uh, healing quite well. So how do you treat these players, though, when it comes to trade value? I don't think Coleman plays this week. So I regardless of whether too. he plays or not, though, how do you view – it might be easy for people to want to run and trade Matt Breeder or Mostert. Mostert especially, on the basis that, look, his time is running out. Is that a mistake? To trade Mostert? No. If you can trade him for a startable player, I would do that. I mean, he like Mostert's out there available on people's waiver wires as well. It should be interesting. With I, I think Coleman's going to miss a little bit more time. But do you guys hear the, you guys hear the rumors, the Emmanuel Sanders rumors? No, no do what? tell. There have been some rumors about uh, San Francisco's interest in acquiring em Emmanuel Sanders. And with the Broncos being at 0-4 now, Emmanuel Sanders and Chris Harris Jr. both potentially on the trade block as they look to rebuild the team. So Interesting. You know, the, there's an interest there from Shanahan. Shanahan likes Sanders. I don't know what that would mean for Sanders. I imagine it's worse. Uh, That's the way I kind of envisioned it. Shanahan... Sanders is just great, so I think he'll That's be. True. I think it will be okay. The Shanahan system can put up some pretty prolific passing numbers as well if they have the weapons. And my dynasty shares of Dejon Hamilton smile at the <laughs> at the thought of this happening. Yeah, I mean, it, I I don't know how much you buy into the rumors. I mean, this was speculation based on some people around the team, but it would make Cortland Sutton a very attractive trade target yes. because he's already him and Sanders are both pretty much neck and neck on the season, and if 
If it's Sutton and Hamilton, now we had that chance last year with no Emmanuel Sanders. It didn't come to fruition, but Sutton's looked like but a better player this year. Rookies? Yeah. Much so better guys. If Tevin, rookie's going to rook, Mike. Yeah, you always, you always say that, not me. If Tevin Coleman <laughs> is out this week, which right now is a little early to tell, but it does seem like he's not ready to come back yet. If he's out, obviously you could start Breed and Mostert. What about <laughs> Jeff Wilson? <laughs> no. I'm not going to do it. Not going to roll the dice? I'm not. No. I'm not. All right. What are things looking like in Denver at the running back position? You've got Lindsey and Freeman. It's been kind of a rough ride. You had a very strong week three for Philip Lindsey. He had 25 touches in week three, 56% of the snaps. I but hate. then week four, you know, Royce Freeman, 62% of the snaps. Philip Lindsey, 45%, 10 touches to each guy. This is, if you look at the snap counts and you look at the trends, you realize there are no trends. There's not a trending up player or a trending down player it's 50 50 one week it's 53 47 philip Lindsay. the next week it's 52 48 royce freeman the next week it's 56 49 philip Lindsay. the next week it's 45 62 royce freeman it's just it's a 50 50 split and so and you can't even make the argument of well i want philip Lindsay because he's the goal line guy he is well i want royce freeman because he's the passing down guy he is they're they're more involved in those two roles it's just a 50-50 split of a bad offense. That makes it very difficult. Makes it stupid, man. <laughs> Don't you're these speaking coaches from know a we very play fantasy? You're, you're speaking from a very visceral Royce Freeman ownership perspective. Yes, I am. Also a man who flexed Royce Freeman last week. Yes, I did. So you would love to see clarity in production, and I don't think you're going to see either. No, not until the, – the only clarity that's going to come here is injury. Nobody is winning this job outright – they're both playing very well. I, I believe that, you know, the eyeball test, they, they're doing their job. I don't see why the coach would change what he's doing, but if an injury happened to either, then you've got value here. If you look at it on the course of the season, you've pretty much been happy playing them once each over the course <laughs> of four weeks. Right. And, you know, Lindsey had the monstrous game against Green Bay, but you drafted him to be something – and then, you know, finishing 31st, 30th, and 42nd, that's not exactly the upside you need to help your team. Makes for a really tough situation. Are there trade options? Would you would you look to move Philip Lindsay on the heels of last year's big uh, – you know, you had the big game in Green Bay. Last year he was – I don't think you can get anything from last year. Like, we're, we're four weeks in. That – last year's equity is gone. You might be able to get something for Philip Lindsay this year. Well, here's, here's a He's the running question. back 15 on the season. Two weeks ago, he was the running back three, had a big blow-up performance. And yeah. if I could if I could get something valuable, I, I would. So here's a real question that nobody thought could be a question. Would you trade Philip Lindsay for Ronald Jones? Because Ronald Jones has finished in the top 22 straight weeks. I've heard from multiple people out of Tampa Bay. We didn't have an official report on this. But multiple people contacted me around the team to let me know that in week two, the anomalous week two of Ronald Jones' disappearing act, that he, and they were vehement, he came off the field with the toe injury. That's why he did not play in the rest of that game, which I, I believe. There were some rumors right away on, in that game. Nobody came out and publicly stated anything. But if you take that game out, if he was hurt, and that's why he didn't see the field, because it wasn't like he saw the field and wasn't productive, 26th, 19th, 17th for Ronald Jones. Yeah, Ronald Jones is absolutely trending way up. If you could trade Phil Lindsay for Jones, I would hope to get like a package, like try and sneak an extra player from the, maybe an upgrade at wide receiver as well. Like you, you send a wide out and you get a better wide out back. Yeah, I, I would try and do that, like formulated in a type of a package. But if it just has to be a one for one trade, <sighs> I mean. Yeah. Is this a stay water still, situation where you try to move on the player that's trending the right direction and the, the, the running game obviously in Tampa is working? I would I would personally still take Lindsay. We've seen the talent work, but I totally understand the argument. It looks like the volume is going to be more sure for Ronald Jones over Lindsay, but I'm gonna take the talent. Okay. All right. Uh let's move on to what what is going on in Oakland? Is this a product uh, – week one, we saw Josh Jacobs absolutely dominate. It was an impressive debut, 74% of the snaps at the running back position. You know, week two, week three, week four, it's not been the same for Josh Jacobs. Fantasy owners don't know what to do. They've got a Chicago matchup coming up and then a bye week. 
What do you do with Josh Jacobs right now? Well, it, it's it's really, really weird because so week one, he was a workhorse. 74% of snaps. The next closest was 16% from Jalen Richard. Then we talked about the illness that happened to Josh Jacobs. Got really sick. Was not used. Less than 50% of the snap counts in week two. Even fewer in week three. While the other two guys there, Jalen Rashard, Jalen Rashard, <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> Jalen Rashard uh, was go. thirty-one and forty-nine percent snap share. So last week, I was pretty confident in Josh Jacobs getting back together. Now that he's past the illness, and he was fifty-four percent of the snaps compared to twenty-eight and nineteen percent from Rashard and DeAndre Washington. But the weird thing was, this is a game Oakland was winning. This is the perfect game script for the running back. And they didn't use him as much as we would hope. Well, yeah, his snaps were low. His usage was perfectly fine, though. 17 carries, almost 80 rushing yards, two re two receptions. The receiving game is where things are really lacking. And it's the Raiders just overall were not... We're not seeing that type of production that we were hoping for for any of, of these running backs in the passing game. So Jacobs, he was only there for 54, 54%, but he was on the field. He was getting used. J Jacobs is a full hold for me or even a buy. I would I would not be trying to sell off Josh Jacobs. I think that things are trending up for him. Uh, and I would, pr I would actually wait a week for the buy. And I mean for, that two you, different ways. Because of Chicago? Uh, you got the Chicago matchup yeah. that saw Dalvin Cook get stifled for the majority of that game. I don't think Jacobs is going to be on the field as much if they're playing from behind in this one. I think you wait for his bye week when nobody wants him, and then you buy him on the bye, Mike. Yeah, I, I don't mind that. the 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 one problem with with that is I, I, the matchup is terrible against Chicago, and there are arguments that can be made about Chicago's quarterback. Are they did they make a lateral move moving from Trubisky to Daniel? Or it, did it get worse? Just saying that there is this, a situation where Jacobs just stumbles his way to a couple touchdowns. The 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 yard per carry is not great, but he ends up with an okay fantasy. I will game. say this: I'm, I'm I watched the film on him this week. He looked great to yeah. me in the, in that work. He wasn't as productive as week one, but he did have the highest snap count since week one. And to me, he looked like the best running back by far, the one we know him to be. So maybe it is a buy opportunity for Jacobs. But you got to be a team that can withstand a Chicago week and a bye week yes. in, a, in any sort of trade. So uh, that would be what I'm looking at. All right, let's take a look at the New England backfield. Now, mm. you might have to hold your eyes open. Mm. I'm going to have to hold my food down. It's, this so, is not good. So this last week against Buffalo, James White was on the field 52% of the time. Sonny Michel, 45%. Rex Burkett, 18%. In, in the previous weeks, I mean, week three, Burkhead was 74% of the time. Now, James White was out of that game, so that kind of disturbs the balance. If you look at week one and two, you might see a little bit more of what this team's actually looking to do. Which is gross. Week two against <laughs> Miami, 49% Michelle, 31% White, 24% Burkhead. That's about how I see the backfield. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you could argue that week one, 33% Sony, 47% James White, 46% Rex Burkhead, I mean, you're, you're going to be between week one and week two, which is basically a, a, a very three-way split backfield. Now, they have the fifth most rushing attempts as a team and the second most ru running back receptions. Thank you, James White. So the volume is there, but you're splitting this three ways. Uh, you know, because you expect the Patriots to score a lot of points, they've got the easiest schedule in the known universe, I would say that you can start – all three of them, but you have to like close your eyes when you click submit lineup. Mike, would you rather have David Montgomery or Sonny Michelle rest of the season? Wow. Uh, As you think about that, I think it's David Montgomery. David Montgomery, the last four weeks, has an actual trend in snap count 38%, 44%, 67%, 69%. 24 touches this past week against Minnesota. Now, it was tough sledding against Minnesota. Because it's Minnesota. But, but Mike Davis has seen four touches over the last three weeks total. He has been worked out of that rotation. They came out against Minnesota. They used Tariq Cohen extensively in the beginning of that game. Seemed like the scripted portion 
Right. Tariq Cohen's real big on the scripted portion. Sure. Each and every week. But over the back half of that game, it was a lot of David Montgomery. Yeah, and Montgomery's opportunity is going up. Sony Michel, at the end of the year, he will be a very interesting player to when we run our truth series. All of January, we break down the truth of these fantasy players, how they actually got there, because all of us fall victim to looking at end of season statistics, end of season rankings. And Sony Michel, I believe by the end, he'll he'll look just fine. And you'll be He'll have a thousand yards of Ted touchdown. He'll look like running back. 18 or something and you got to be reminded how did he actually get there and I would prefer David Montgomery's path where I know that the work is going to happen on a weekly basis instead of Sony Michelle where I'm just crossing my fingers hoping that the touchdown comes should Tariq Cohen be owned uh, 39% of snaps seven touches own, eight he touches six touches six touches seven touches on a bench yes but much like the way that Philip Lindsay and and Royce Freeman should be on people's benches because if a if the situation breaks in a in the right way for a player like if someone's going to miss time if David Montgomery misses time then then Tariq Cohen's touches are going to go way up yeah but I will say this I, I I had Tariq Cohen I've dropped him already moved on needed to make some roster moves I totally get he's worthy to be on a bench if you've got that luxury but the difference between him and uh Philip Lindsay or Royce Freeman if you look at their touches both of those guys have had double digit touches every single week all the way sure. up to 25 touches 19 touches whereas you're you're getting six touches a game and and yes Tariq Cohen is getting his in the passing game he's a more electric per touch player but it's, it's hard to bank on a guy getting a few touches a game without a quality, competent quarterback that's moving the ball and with a defense that says, that's just fine. All right, what about the Eagles' backfield situation? In weeks one and two, Miles Sanders was at 48%, 43% of the snap uh, percentage. In weeks three and four, thirty four percent, thirty five percent. Yeah, fumbling will do that. Yeah, and and you you've seen Jordan Howard obviously really effective against Green Bay, fifty three percent of the snaps, eighteen touches, scored three times, total touchdown wise. We haven't seen Darren Sproles really touching the ball. He's out there frequently, but he wasn't in week four, and so I think we can be be a little bit encouraged if the trend is towards these two guys, but. Who do you want rest of season, and how do you see Miles Sanders' Oof. situation playing out? Because he's he's the more explosive player, but he seems to be the less trusted player. Well, Howard Howard's good. Like Howard is an excellent grinder at the running back position, and that sometimes that's what your team needs. Like last week, it worked out perfectly for Howard. Had a few people uh, hit hit the t uh, the uh, the Twitter mentions saying, "You guys didn't really talk about Jordan Howard as a pickup. What should I do?" And I was like. Yeah, you can pick him up, but I feel like if you're picking Howard up to play him, you are just chasing those points of last week. He he has overproduced immensely in the touchdown category, padded by that multi-touchdown game he just had against Green Bay. He's in okay play every week. Between him and Miles Sanders, though, that's where the conversation gets much more difficult because – I want to stash Miles Sanders for the unknown upside if he actually starts getting the work, but on a weekly play, Jordan Howard probably is the better play, the better eagle because he's getting the goal line carries. Yeah, you've got a rookie who's talented but troublesome, has cost them some, you know, drives with fumbling, and then you have Jordan Howard who has been keeping drives alive, scoring touchdowns, being efficient, being a quality vet, and this is going if. No matter how great either one of these players play, I think we can I think we can be confident that Doug Peterson is going to use a committee. That none of these guys if Miles Sanders was just the most amazing talent, he's still going to be in a committee. And if that's the case, I want Jordan Howard, who's the clear when they get in the red zone, they bring him in. They move the chains. They score touchdowns. I, I want the touchdown upside in fantasy. Yeah, I, I lean the Miles Sanders direction out touching Howard three or four weeks and like Mike said I mean it, you take it for what you will Jordan Howard I think he scored four times on the year yeah JJ Zacharyson came out and he was talking about you know there's there's metrics that number fire presents that show the average touchdowns to the opportunity and you know Howard should be in the like one one and a half touchdown range 
and he's got four on the season, so he's overproduced in that like department. Like I said, the, the, the Eagles were gifted a lot of things in that game against Green Bay. They for, were. For positive offensive things to happen. But I think at the end of the day, I mean, Miles Sanders and Jordan Howard or Phillip Lindsay and Royce Freeman? I mean, which combination of running backs would, do you want? I would rather have the Eagles because I expect the Eagles' offense, especially when Deshaun Jackson gets back, to be a much more prolific, higher-scoring team. fair. All right, one wide receiver snap count breakdown before we uh, get into some mailbag. Maybe get into the – we will get into the Thursday night preview. But um, you guys want to look at this Jacksonville wide receiver core? Sure. Do you, do you believe in DJ Chark moving forward? I do. 70 uh, – he's been around the mid-70s snap counts. Uh, Didi saw his snap percentage drop in week four against Denver – but target-wise, it seems like Westbrook and Chark are the only two that you're really interested in. And you buy Chark season long. I, I'm buying him. He was a second-round pick. He was he, he was the forgotten second-round pick because he's in Jacksonville where you, you didn't love the passing volume. Projecting them into this season, was it was difficult to give a rosy outlook to anyone but Dede Westbrook because of what the team has been in the past where – you get infected by Blake Bortles and his ineffective passing attempts, the fact that they want to be a team led by Leonard Fournette. So it was hard to really buy into DJ, DJ Chark taking that next step. But to me, he has been. He's a, that second-round pick. He's crazy fast. We have seen the trend of speed killing in the NFL just over and over and yeah, over. The touchdown call back. He, yes, he would have had a touchdown every single week. Had it not been for one of the a penalty that could have been the, the flag could have been left in the pocket on this particular play, I'm in. I've on got DJ Chark. Let, let's put that to the test because I got some interesting names and I, I'm reading through these and saying, who would I rather have, DJ Chark or Marvin Jones? Marvin Jones has had one of four weeks where you've really been happy about him. Sterling Shepard, Jarvis Landry. Where do you put Chark in that group? Shepard is going to have Golden Tate coming. Goodness. Got the rookie. I would rather have Chark over Shepard. Okay, I was and that was the one I was really curious about for you, Mike. I is that because of Golden Tate? Yes, yeah, the return of Golden Tate. Like Shepard was, it was nice getting those those freebie weeks in there. But let's see. I mean, you can say even the same thing for Evan Engram. I I still think Engram will be the number one guy on the team. But what happens? Like, does he take the dip in targets? I, man, I think I would take Chark. Over all o three? Over all of those guys. He yeah. does seem to be emerging, yeah, not on having, the injury report. <laughs> I would I would take him over Jarvis Landry. Landry had the monster huge week this week, but prior to that, he hadn't been in the top 40 at the position. He's you know hard to trust. So like, the upcoming schedule for DJ Chark against Carolina, don't love it for DJ Chark. I'm still willing to play him, but then he gets New Orleans at home. And then he gets the Bengals. I mean, you have two plus matchups as based on fantasy points allowed right now coming up for DJ. Yeah, Adam Thielen. Oh gosh. <laughs> Wait, are uh, you? I'm more trolling on that okay, one. Okay, I was like, yeah, I mean, that's not a real question. No, but the the reason the name is there is because Adam Thielen is worse on the season than every name that I mentioned ahead of yeah. you. Yeah. So whether it's Sterling Shepard, Marvin Jones, Jarvis Landry, or DJ Chark. Honestly, this poor, poor Adam Thielen is down there in the. This part sad of the season category. is, it becomes incredibly difficult to make that decision. Yes, Andy, like you're talking about, where DJ Chark is emerging as a fantasy player, and by next year you could look back and say, well, well of course, DJ Chark is a he's a great fantasy pick. We're going to draft him in the in the fourth or fifth round. Meanwhile, these players that have, they still are holding on to their name value. And that's what you're you're grasping onto. That's your teddy bear keeping you warm at night. Meanwhile, you you got to stay water and realize that players emerge in fantasy every single year, and you look stupid until you don't by buying into the player who's breaking out. I, yeah, that's absolutely right. And there are certain players that you are kind of you're handcuffed and you have to stick with the Hopkins. Right. Uh, I, I'm not talking Julio, about those guys. But when you get into that middle tier. And you're starting to be frustrated week in and week out. It's very hard. It's hard to pivot, but it's hard to stay. It's hard to keep throwing a player out there over and over again. Like a, a player. So for for Thielen, I get it. 
I'd yeah, be staying with Thielen, but go to the, his counterpart, Stephon Diggs. You want Stephon Diggs for the rest of the year, or you want DJ Chark? I don't want that question. Exactly. That's what I don't want. Exactly. I didn't want it either. <laughs> Thursday Night Breakdown. All right, the 3-1 and one Rams take on the 3-1 and one Seahawks. The game's up in century length. The Seahawks are one-and-a-half-point favorites at home, 49-point over under. Last year, both of the Rams-Seahawks games went way over their Vegas line, and the 49 points, that's a nice line to begin with. We saw Jared Goff throw the ball 68 times last week. We saw a very efficient performance from Russell Wilson, but they didn't need him very much in Arizona. On the year, Wilson has been great. So far, so good on the fantasy production for Russell Wilson. He ranks 10th in passing yards per game, uh, which is up from his career average. He's got a career-best 72.9% completion percentage. And then you've had Jared Goff be extremely I – think, I think the consensus that I've heard from national media and from my eyeballs is that this isn't quite the same team that we saw last year. Correct. I mean, it's just – they're not throwing the, you know, Gurley's not Gurley. Goff's not Goff. Woods up until last week hasn't been Woods. They're winning games, and they were right on the precipice of winning against Tampa, obviously, but them losing that game at home against Tampa shows you that they're not quite what they were last season. Yeah, I was going to say last year both of these games hit the over because the Seahawks can do whatever it takes to win. If they're down, if they need to score a lot, they can. They have Russell Wilson. Now what they want to do. But the Rams last year were scoring on anybody and everybody the last yeah. two years. That's not the Rams we've seen so far this season. Would I, I I don't know that I would take the over here. In fact, I'm a little worried about Jared Goff. He, he has not been great. We've talked a lot about the home road splits. Now he's on the road. In one of the worst places to play. Absolutely. The 12th man is real there in Seattle. So this is one of those, like, I'll, I'll be honest, and this is gross, I apologize to both of you first and the Foot Clan for even speaking this out loud. But I have Jared Goff, and I am contemplating whether I'm starting him or Andy Dalton. <laughs> <laughs> yes, live in the stream, bathe in its refreshing waters. Yeah, so I, I, I have not come to a decision, but I need to obviously Wait, what tomorrow. league is this? It's a league you know. <laughs> it's a league you know and love. Okay, Jason, I could I could take the 30 seconds and go research it, but just tell I me what league I know it's not League it. of Record. I believe this is the Listener League. Okay. So, hold is Jacoby out there? J uh, no. Oh, okay. You Yesterday, you blew my mind talking about Andy Dalton on the show as your streamer of the week. Okay, it's not Today, a, you're it's blowing not my mind. Play. Today, you're blowing my mind with the Dalton over Goff. I will still trust in McVay, Goff, Cup, Woods, Cooks, Gurley over Dalton, Auden Tate, Tyler Boyd, Tyler Eifert. Yes. No, I completely so, agree. And in the fact that John Ross but this is, your is team. out hurts big time. I mean, this was a decision that I had I had picked up uh, Dalton last week for this. Now Dalton had a horrific Monday night football Goff threw the ball more, so it, it probably will be Goff, but that's the world we're living in here. Sure. All right, these two teams, defensively, what are you expecting them to do with Gurley and Chris Carson? Carson last week, you know, he's averaging 20.5 opportunities per game. He got charted with 21 broken or missed tackles in the game. Cardinals will do that to you. How is that possible? That's an unprecedented amount. And we were there. We saw Chris Carson consistently yeah. gain an extra yard, 2, 5, 11. And he looked great. But Rashad Penny is supposed to be active and available in this game. This is going to be extremely interesting. If I have Chris Carson, I am playing him with full confidence. However, like the this, this storybook that's playing out for Chris Carson is going to be fascinating because – he was losing work, losing potentially losing his job to Rashad Penny because of the fumbling. Penny misses the game uh, to Chris Carson's favor, and Carson delivers against a, a bad defense. So, it was that enough for Pete Carroll to call to to fall back and 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 pull things back on 
trying to force Rashad Penny out there a bit more. Yeah, I think yeah, you see is. more of week one and two, and the Rams are giving up 23.5 fantasy points per game to the running back position, which is 25th in the league. So you have to start, Carson. 100%. That's, I'm, I'm playing him, but I'm saying what to watch for is what do those snap counts for, for Penny actually look like? Because there was, there was a lot of pro size in the red zone and on the goal line garbage. He got a touchdown. Yeah. Was that his only touch of the game? Oh, uh, no. No. No, he was unfortunately getting uh, the ball. He got three touches. Three. <laughs> See? Was not his only touch. <laughs> Such conviction. I was right. You I remember him out there. You, you, you're the rightest. Um, Carson, we're playing him. Gurley, we're playing him. Through four weeks, the Rams have the fewest running back receptions in the league despite Gurley's seven receptions this past week. And I don't think those seven receptions were a product of the normal game plan as much as being down 45 to 40 at one point in the game right. and playing catch up frequently. They were down three scores in that game. So that's a problem for Gurley's long term value. Carson or Gurley, rest of the season? You're a terrible person. Yeah. I, <laughs> hey, man. I think at, I that's think why they point, pay us the middle bucks. Come on. I think at this point, uh, you got to go, Chris Carson. You, you, there's still that hope and that dream. I mean, if you watch the press conference with Gurley after the game, he's pissed. He is not happy with his not utilization. Being, yeah, he's. He, so he, why'd you choose Carson he, then? I went with Carson because no matter what we dream, that's going to change. It does not seem like Todd Gurley is going to be the centerpiece of the offense. Gotcha. We can want it all we do. Todd right. Gurley is pouting about it, and it, he's still not being the centerpiece of the offense. I hope as a girly owner in our dynasty league, that he starts getting the ball 25 times a game. But I just don't see why would that happen? Like, it, it would have happened already. Well, yeah. it, it could happen because they don't look very good and they just lost. Putting the putting the ball in Jared Goff's hand 68 times did, did not result in a victory. Yeah, they needed so, more. Right? 68 wasn't enough. Right. McVay, go up. Yeah. Let's yeah, try McVay. 75. It is interesting. Rushing yards per game, obviously, we the narrative has been the Seahawks, that's how you win the football game for Seattle. But that's not been the case this year. I mean, Russell Wilson's yards per game has been much higher than his career average, and the rushing yards per game for Seattle is in the bottom half through four weeks. So part of what made Carson extremely attractive is the thought that despite 55 60% of snaps, this is a team that runs more than everybody in football by a wide, wide margin. I think they'd love to get back to doing that. So it, it, but it, it hasn't part of the fruition yet. Part of the narrative was that their defense was going to be able to figure it out, and thus far, they have not. But they didn't figure it out last year. Well, their right? defense, I mean, they didn't figure it out last year, and they still ran the ball. They were they were better than they are this year. Okay, well, Arizona helped them. Yeah, from a season long statistical standpoint. Tyler Lockett, you're playing. Yes. Cup, Woods, Cooks, you're playing. Yes. DK Metcalf, are you interested in him as a flex play? Uh, not really, but it does make sense. He's being utilized around the goal line. His red zone usage is is exactly what you hope for, but it hasn't been yielding the, the fantasy points, and so I would have a real hard time actually putting him in the lineup. You, you could say the process is right. But if he's not going to get done, he's not getting it done. The the hard part is going back to the well after a great matchup for, for DK Metcalf. He had four targets, but he had one reception for six yards. If you look at his actual usage, it's, hey, hey DK, run another nine route. So much like the earlier years of Tyler Lockett before he turned into the, the most efficient man in the world, like – that's what it was. It would okay, lock it, run deep. Sometimes you'll sometimes you'll connect with Russell, and that's what it's going to be for Metcalf. So he's he he's an okay nitro boost for your flex position, but you are you are definitely gambling. But over sixty yards, three straight weeks to open the season before the dud last week. He also has been targeted in the end zone the same amount of times that I believe Will Disley has been. Disley has like four touchdowns on the year. DK Metcalf has one. So. Whether that's Metcalf's fault, not coming down with it, whether it's the way the ball bounced, which is often the case, you could see that balance out. It seems like they're turning to those two players. They're much bigger than Tyler Lockett, and they represent a red zone uh, weapon. 
It, he's an interesting guy to keep your eyes on. I yeah. think I lean Chark over Metcalf rest of the season, but I sure like sure. Metcalf being connected with Russell Wilson as opposed to what we will see, which is you know Gardner Minshew hand the ball off to Nick Foles at some point in time and still figure out whether it's the Foles-Westbrook connection or the Foles-Chark connection or what that will be. At the tight end position, Disley. He's a weekly play now. He's been great. Yeah, he does have that outperforming touchdown total number to his name and the statistical advantage of facing an Arizona Cardinals defense. But last week, 7 for 57 and a touchdown. Clearly, Russell Wilson's looking to him. Would you rather have Will Disley or O.J. Howard rest of the season? Disley. There was no hesitation. No. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Like, O.J. That... Howard is one of the people I'm most worried about in the league. The The Buccaneers put up 700 points last week, and O.J. Howard was not – needed to right. do that whereas Disley week in week out it's not just the Cardinals you know he had five receptions six receptions seven receptions the last three weeks clearly eight receptions is coming I mean it's to a lesser extent the the tight end on the other side of the field Gerald Everett it it's a very similar story where he was a second eight targets last week yeah which has doubled his targets on the season because Goff threw the ball 68 times Everett was a second-round pick. He was Sean McVay's first pick ever and because the Rams did not have a first-round pick. An absolute uh, athletic, measurable destroyer. Mount Everest. <laughs> Mount Everest. Yeah, Everett or Everest, whatever you want to call him. But it's just it, it's not it's not happening because the scheme, Sean McVay's scheme does not need to utilize the tight end. And Coach Arians, his scheme – does not utilize the tight end, and that's what we're seeing. It will be interesting. Here's a fun fact from the game. Russell Wilson has never thrown for over 200 yards against a McVay-led Rams team. Ooh. And we know that the Rams have some pretty solid corners. However, I will, last I'm taking week, that this is the week that he breaks that. He breaks it. Okay. Yep. A reminder to take your Thursday night football players out of the flex position, put them in a positional spot on your team, in case you get updated injury news, you need to flex in a different position. It's just a quick reminder we give each and every week on the Wednesday show to remind you to give yourself a little flexibility in your yes. life. Yes. Something I don't have. I can't I can't come close to touching my toes. Who needs to do that? That's what I'm saying. Based on my flexibility. <laughs> so, uh I just that was an incredible stat, the not throwing 200 right. yards against McVay. So I went and I looked. I just wanted to vet it. Both last year and the year before, 198. Yeah. Both times. He's right there. Yeah, that you should set your goals higher, Russell. Yes. <laughs> it's got to go higher than 200. Hey, we want to thank the studio sponsor, Pristine Auction, for uh, sponsoring this podcast. Evan Ingram signed jersey yesterday, $58.97. Check him out at pristineauction.com. Use the code BALLERS. Tomorrow starts of the week. We'll talk about some matchups. We'll get you updated with injuries, get you ready for week five. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.